Okay. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Roman, can you hear me fine? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Okay. Okay, perfect. All right. So thank you all so much for joining in for this presentation today. I would especially like to thank um, Masaryk University and Roman for the opportunity to share this work. I really feel lucky to be able to talk with you about speculative and critical design right now at a time when people in all fields and not just in libraries are very much thinking about the future and how to explore different scenarios about how our work and our home lives are going to change in the next months and years. I really hope that this presentation is going to feed into a larger conversation about critical approaches to library futures with any of you who are interested in that. I'm going to give a little bit of a tour of the Zoom interface before we get started. So in the upper right hand corner, there are two icons. There's a people icon that shows a list of participants. And then there's a talk bubble next to that. That icon opens up a chat sidebar. So please feel free to use the chat window for comments. Um, please mute your microphones unless we're doing a discussion. I think that um, I think that this um, Zoom right now, this this session right now is set up so that when you come in, your microphone is pre-muted, which is good. You can also turn your video feed on or off if you if you would like. The icons for doing that are in the middle of the screen at the bottom. And finally, you can change the layout of the screen if you'd like. So in the lower right hand corner of the interface, there's an icon with three dots. If you click that, a pop-up window will appear. So choosing the Change Layout button will let you switch between Spotlight View, Sidebar View, or Tiled View. All right, so today I'm going to cover three things. I'm going to start with a short introduction of speculative and critical design, where I will show some examples of this kind of design work. Then I'll present a case study where I teamed up with the design researcher, Renee Albrecht Mallinger, to facilitate a reading group for artists who are interested in using speculative design to explore issues around climate change in their work. And finally, we'll have a chance to talk about how libraries might do this kind of design. So right now, I'm going to jump right in and start with some examples of speculative and critical design, along with some precursors to it. So, Italian radical design was a movement in the late 60s that was a very big influence on the way that speculative and critical design is practiced today. There were two really important exhibits for this work. There was Super Architettura in Pistoia, Italy in 1966, and Italy, the New Domestic Landscape at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1972. And so the architects and designers who were involved in these exhibits made models and prototypes that were never intended to be built. Adolfo Natalini was one of these architects. He was one of the co-founders of the architecture firm Super Studio. Along with Arcazoom, they were two of the most important studios in this movement. So Natalini said that once that he became an architect, he couldn't find opportunities to make buildings. So instead, he and his colleagues used drawings, collages, and models to explore their fears and fantasies. So for them, the goal was to be thought provoking and to imagine alternatives to the architecture and design practice of the time, either by taking elements of existing design practice and pushing them to their logical conclusion, or by creating a new type of design to replace the old. A manifesto from Arcazoom and Super Studio describes the super architettura as the architecture of super production, super consumption, super induction to consume, the supermarket, Superman, and Supergas. In the late 60s, Super Studio made a series of films that were designed to raise awareness of the impact of construction on the natural environment. And a lot of speculative and critical design work today produces outputs that are very much inspired by this kind of approach. So today, it's very common to see people working in this way to create products that are never intended to be produced, and to explore their ideas in formats like short films alongside more traditional outputs like architectural models or physical prototypes. So here are a few more examples of some of the sketches that came out of Super Studio. So next up, we have another designer 
This is Dennis Wheel, who made Radio in a Bag in 1981. So in the early 80s, if a product designer was assigned the task of redesigning a radio, normally they would have focused on the shell of the radio, so kind of the outer container. That's the part that kind of hides the electronics that are inside, and it's all that a consumer normally ever gets to see. So when a designer moves the consumer's attention away from the inner workings of a radio and to the outer shell of it, one of the things that happens is that the consumer stops thinking about a radio as its physical components. They start thinking about it as something that's much more intangible than that. They end up choosing one radio over another because the outer appearance of it appeals to them in some way. So by way of comparison, this radio critiques the way that product designers normally work. Rather than designing a radio in a way that makes the inner components recede from view, by putting them in a clear plastic bag, this design focuses the consumer's attention on them so they can keep in mind how the radio works and how it was manufactured. This way of designing a radio might encourage the consumer to repair, modify, or even hack on the original design. We're gonna fast forward a little bit now to the year 2005. So Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby are two important designers who do what we now think of as speculative and critical design work. They taught at the Royal College of Art in London and they published the book Speculative Everything, Design, Fiction, and Social Dreaming in 2013. In 2005, Anab Jain was one of their students at the Royal College. So she made this short film about sharing the wireless network in her home and learning more about her neighbors and how they were using it. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like for all of us to watch this movie together. What I'm going to do is I'm going to post a link to this on Vimeo into the comments of the chat window. So everybody, please go over to Vimeo and take a look at this video with me.
Okay, excellent. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to open it up for a little bit of a discussion to get people's um, kind of immediate feedback on what that movie was like for them. So some of the questions that I was curious about, I'm gonna paste into the chat window. Please feel free to use the chat or to, um, or to unmute your microphone if you have a question that a question or a comment or something that you'd like to share with the group. So first off, I'm curious what people's initial reactions were, just kind of a gut visceral reaction to what that was like. Second, I'm curious, did you find any of the interactions in the movie especially interesting? So whether those are physical or digital. And then finally, um, Anab called this a social design intervention. So thinking about the kinds of software that we're using now, like we're using video conferencing so much more often and we're using group chats so much more often, are there interventions like this that you would be kind of curious to see with software like that or with technology like that?
That's great, Helen. I am. I have that response to a lot of her work too. I think that she does a really great, um, does a really fantastic job of making very subtle ideas very approachable. I agree with that too. I think that she's she's fantastic at interacting with people. One of the things that, thinking about her social skill, one of the things that I think is really noteworthy in this movie especially, is that I think that sometimes it's easy to think of something like speculative and critical design as pretty um, far out or experimental. I think in this case, one of the things that she's doing is she's really doing it in a way that connects it to lots of other user research. So it's really clear to see how essentially how she interacts with people and how she talks to them. The user research aspect of what she does seems really clear to me in this one. I think that's also a great point about the interactions with strangers. So um, Stefan just asked about um, awareness of privacy violations. I think that my sense of this video is that initially she did it because people were stealing her Wi-Fi and she wanted to learn more about them. So I'm not sure if that gets at what you're asking about with that question. But I think that in a, um, I think that the video was a way for her to essentially learn about the people who initially she thought of as stealing her Wi-Fi. So Tomas asked about um, change in behavior from the users of the yellow chair. My sense here is that what she was trying to do is to understand how people behave, not to alter their behavior. So I think it really was just a case of her wanting to learn more about the people that were the people that were in her neighborhood but were sort of invisible to her because they were just using a digital interface. Um, so really, it's just to to kind of learn more about those people and not necessarily to to do anything with that information yet. I think that if she wanted to build onto that product and start to and start to do something that would change the way people behave, then she could have done that. But for the sake of this product, I think it was really just to learn and then that was it. So thank you all so much for those comments. Yes. Yes, exactly. Thank you all so much for those comments. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to show a video that came after that. So after being a student at the Royal College, she went on to start the design firm Superflux, and they focus on speculative and critical design specifically. On their website, they introduce themselves by saying, from unprecedented technological acceleration to climate change and political unrest, we're living in precarious times. But with uncertainty comes opportunity for positive change. We believe that through understanding, foresight, and creativity, we can create tools that not only allow insight into forces at play, but to help to shape democratic, positive, and rewarding futures. By creating concrete experiences from the future, we want to transform decision-making today. So this film is a way to explore a treatment for a degenerative condition of the eye that uses retinal prosthetics. So in contrast to hearing implants, progress on the technology for retinal implants has been very slow. And this video explores how users might interact with this technology 
and what are some possibilities of this new type of vision. So this is a project where she was um, collaborating in depth with medical researchers. I'm going to put a link to this one in the chat box too. And if we could all go and watch this one next, we can see an example of Superflux work from a few years later. So this is after she started the, that firm, after graduating.
Um, Roman mentioned uh, Black Mirror. I think that this type of design work is a serious influence on that show. So if, um, if anyone hasn't seen that one, I, I highly recommend it. I think that it is, is a very, very approachable introduction to this kind of work. So I have a few questions for the group for this one too. One of the things that I'm curious about here is, so one of the things that I really enjoy about design work is that there are lots of opportunities to work with people who are experts in other fields. So I'm very curious here for people that have had the chance to have those kind of collaborations with other people that do different types of work. What are some of the rewards and challenges of that? Because this is a project where Superflux was collaborating with medical researchers. So it's people who have very different skills, very different concerns. What are those kinds of partnerships like? From watching a video like this, what do you think that the designers who put this video together brought to that partnership is my next question. And finally, can you think of places where librarians and designers might work together and collaborate? So what might a project like this for libraries be like? And again, I'll open it up to the group. Do people have any thoughts about these things? What do you think about this? I'll give it another minute to see if people are typing. Um, if you don't have feedback on this one, it's okay, but let me see. I think that there's definitely, um, I think that one of the things that's key here is that the designers are, are approaching it in a way that's very, very different from how the medical community would approach technology like this. So it's like, it really is trying to bring a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of story to, to technology like that. It's trying to think about what are the kind of emotional implications of technology like that. I think that that's also very, that's a very good comment, Roman. Because I think that here the designers are also trying to kind of redefine what their role is too. So it's like, they're not just making, um, they're not just making an attractive case for this product, in a, essentially, the way that the, the way that a designer might have made a case for a radio. It's like the designers are kind of getting more deeply involved in what the product means in a kind of in a kind of way that's a little bit new. I think that that's definitely true as far as working with experts in other fields. And that genuinely is one of the things that I really value about doing this kind of work. It's just there are lots of opportunities to do things like that. And I think that it's great. I think that it's especially interesting so for me working in a university, um, there are lots of chances to do that because of the way the university works. I think that thinking about speculative and critical design specifically, it, it kind of extends a lot of the things that I enjoy about working for a university in the first place. Okay, that was great. Thank you all so much for doing that. And also, thank you so much for thank you so much for um, kind of participating in this experiment. It's really neat to see everybody kind of press play at the same time and then come back with comments in the chat window.
I definitely mean interdisciplinary collaboration for sure. And I agree with these other comments too. I mean, as far as needing lots of different approaches to creating things and things like that. So next, I'm gonna go back to my slides and I'm gonna start to share a little bit of information about uh, a case study. This was a project where uh, a colleague and I ran a reading group at an arts organization in Chicago. One of the things that I think is interesting about this as a project is that um, it's difficult to try and find ways sometimes to apply speculative and, and critical design. How would you do something like this? I think that a reading group is actually an ideal format for something like this. So I'm gonna go back to sharing my slides now and I'll get into that next. Okay, so here we started a reading group and the goal of this group was to help a group of artists respond to climate change through a combination of readings, design projects, and activities. When we did this, we wanted to be open to facilitating a wide range of artistic responses. So we were thinking about potentially people would want to make activist art where the aim of the artwork was to create some kind of political or social change. Um, we also wanted people to be able to respond aesthetically or in whatever way made sense for them. If you find the idea of using ideas from design to facilitate work like this inspiring, I hope that when you do it, you'll do it with kind of a realistic idea of the work that goes into creating positive change in that way. I think that very often people can be really enthusiastic about design as a field. When we put this reading group together, we wanted to use that optimism as a way to start a project where we got to get together with artists and read interesting writing on important problems. So if you'd like to copy this project and do your own reading groups, uh, I hope that you will. If you can facilitate the work of artists like we did, I think that it's great. If you choose to work with a different group of people, I hope that you will do that too. Generally, when I do a project like this, I'm very interested in trying to find ways that design approaches can be improved. I tend to be pretty skeptical of design activities in general. I think that in lots of contexts, contexts they can mask implicit assumptions about who gets to express themselves and how, whose ideas matter, and what kinds of outputs are valuable. I think that when sharing work like this, it can be really useful for me to talk a little bit about my individual point of view. So generally, I think of myself as a person who's very privileged. Um, I live in a large city in a wealthy country. I was able to afford a graduate degree from a design school. At the same time, I was the first person in my family to go to college. I attended a local university where I took most of my classes in the evenings. My father worked in a factory. First, he was a machinist, and later he was a manager. And in addition to caring for me and my brother and sister, my mom worked as a secretary and as a babysitter, and she sold cosmetics. She did lots of little jobs. For me personally, approaches like speculative and critical design give me a chance to think about my life and my work from a more critical perspective. And they let me explore issues that are important to me while doing design and development work. Because I work as a programmer during the day, this is a way to kind of um, give me a little bit of context around my work and how it fits in. In general, I think that the field of design is very good at selling things to me, but I think that it can be very bad at being self-critical. So trying to figure out how I can incorporate a perspective like this into design and programming work is sometimes a bit of a bumpy ride, but it's exciting and I feel very lucky to be able to do this. So if you've ever taken a design workshop, you might have used how might we statements to stay focused on a problem that you're working on. So as we worked through this project, we thought in terms of several of these how might we statements. So first, how might we use design methods to help artists produce work that responds to climate? Second, how might we identify methods that are not good at this? And third, how might we identify methods that are better? So 
Our project took place at a community lab called Latitude. I'm going to give some information about them next. Latitude is basically, I think of it as a kind of makerspace that's geared towards artists and photographers. They have large format printers, high-end scanning equipment, and things like that. They operate an artist in residence program, and they organize regular education and arts programming. That's um, our reading group fit into their educational programming series. They also function as a service bureau. So if you would like high quality prints produced, or if you need film scanned for those types of prints, then they can do that sort of work for you for a fee. So originally, Latitude was founded in May of 2012 by a group of artists and educator, including a master printer named Walter Blackwell. He owned a printing, uh, printing business called Black Point Editions. The people that founded Latitude recognized that Chicago's art making and photographic communities suffered a drastic lack of access to high-end digital media equipment outside of academic institutions. Um, all of these notes are from an email exchange with Colleen Kime, who's the executive director of Latitude. The founders of Latitude were also driven to create a non-commercial, non-institutional space for generative public programming related to the arts and photography that could act as a bridge between makers and thinkers of all types. Drawing on the models of four successful and established peer organizations, the Philadelphia Photo Art Center, Portland's New Space Center for Photography, San Francisco's Reiko Photo Arts Center, and Syracuse's Light Work, the founders created Latitude as a similar resource for Chicago's image makers. In 2014, Latitude received uh, official nonprofit status so they could begin pursuing grants and donations. In 2015, they established an administrative fellowship program with two to three people working annually to advance their programming, marketing, and education needs. And they now have fellowships that include education, programming, and community outreach. So our group was about speculative and critical design. When I first introduced this to the people that were in our group, because we were working with people that had arts backgrounds and not design backgrounds, one of the things that we did was we showed them a futures cone, which we got to see in the presentation earlier today. This is one way to think about what speculative design tries to do. It tries to explore realistic or thought-provoking scenarios at different points in the future where a given scenario can be more or less probable, plausible, or preferable. So one of the things that I really like about asking people to think critically when I present a diagram like this, and this was a thing that Bridget brought up in the, in the presentation this morning too, is that this is a diagram that if you're not careful with it, you can, you can kind of miss the point that this is a, a version of the future from a specific point of view for a specific person. So generally, there's a lot of fuzziness in the way that designers classify their work. Our reading group was about speculative design, but critical design is an approach that has a lot of overlap. So for me, critical design is an especially useful neighboring approach here. Anthony Dunn and Fiona Ravi, who I mentioned earlier, are two important figures for both types of design work. Critical design tries to take a critical theory-based approach, where the goal is to use the language of design to stimulate discussion about the social and ethical implications of technology. So this is a work from Dunn and Ravi that starts to talk about what that might look like in practice. In column A, they list qualities of traditional design work, and for each quality, column B contains an alternative that describes critical design. So for them, critical design is critical, not affirmative, problem finding, not problem solving, and design in the service of society instead of design in the service of shareholders. So this next one is an example to show what this kind of design work can look like in practice. This is the Toaster Project by Thomas Thwaites. This was inspired by a quote from the writer Douglas Adams, who wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He said, left to his own devices, he couldn't even build a toaster. He could just about make a sandwich, and that was it. So the goal here was to see what it would take to make a toaster from scratch. Thomas bought a toaster for $5, um, thinking that this would be the, the easiest one to reverse engineer. 
But even then he discovered that that cheap toaster contained about 400 components. So he looked at all of the pieces of a toaster and reduced them to the simplest parts that he could. And he saw that this product contained steel, mica, plastic, copper, and nickel. So if he wanted to make a toaster from scratch, one of the things that he did was he went to a small mine that was being operated as a tourist attraction, and he convinced them to give him iron ore. So he made steel out of that with a leaf blower and a microwave. Then he went to Scotland to dig mica out of the ground, and he made a mold for a plastic case, this kind of disgusting drippy case that covers this thing. He made a mold for that out of an empty tree trunk. So this is the finished product. Um, again, this is kind of an alternative to a lot of traditional design work. Rather than promoting a designer as a person with a kind of almost magical ability to make things, to me, a toaster like this is a way to talk about how limited designers actually are. They're sort of small parts in an enormous system that's set up to produce things like this cheaply. As part of his project, he snuck his toaster into a display at a store and put a price on it. He priced his work at several thousand dollars. So I think that this is, is interesting because it kind of demonstrates how different critical design is from other types of design work. So next I'm gonna give two examples of this kind of design work from libraries specifically. First up, we've got a project from Rachel Ivy Clark who presented this poster at the American Library Association conference in 2017. So for this project, what she did was she lists events from the real history of libraries starting from the Library of Alexandria and she moved to concerns of the present day like the introduction of Google. After that, the timeline moves into a possible future with events like the closing of Harvard University and the Bibliothèque Nationale. When she put this timeline together, she used events from the past as an inspiration for a speculation about the future. So things like the, the opening of a major library have a correlating event in the future, like a library closing. When she put this project together, she said that she was concerned about what the response might be because certain aspects of what she did here were deliberatively provocative. However, she said that the piece did what she wanted it to do. When people saw it, it sparked lots of small conversations about long-term possibilities for the future of libraries. And this helped people to think about futures that might otherwise have been difficult for them to discuss. The next project is I would say more of a critical design project than a speculative design project, but I think that it's one that's also very good. This is a text-based adventure game from the librarian Fabazi Attar, who also developed the concept of vocational awe. So I think that this is a great example of critical design. This is a game that's about microaggressions. And here you can play as one of two characters. You can be Alex, who is a white, able-bodied gay man, or Leslie, who's an African-American straight woman who has a disability. And in this game, what you do is you start a new job and you experience coworkers saying things that are more or less hurtful. You get to choose how to respond, but as you play, there's a small kind of meter that shows what Alex or Leslie's stress level is like, and that increases as things go on. So finally, because our reading group was about global warming, I'm gonna give a little bit of background about that. Um, like I mentioned before, I really appreciate this kind of work because I get to interact with experts. So I just wanna give a little bit of a disclaimer here that I don't have a background in science. Um, however, because one of the books that we read in our reading group was um, Imagining the Future of Climate Change by Shelley Streeby, I appreciated the way that she laid out a history of global warming. And because that was a book that we covered in our group, I'm going to use an abbreviated version of our timeline here. One of the things that I like about this timeline is that this is obviously coming from the perspective of someone who's an activist. So in 1827, we have the mathematician Joseph Fourier, who formulated what we now call the theory of the greenhouse effect. In 1859, John Tyndall identified greenhouse gases. And in 1896, we had predictions of how much the climate would change based on changing concentrations of atmospheric carbon. In the 1940s, the technology for measuring CO2 improved dramatically. 
And in 1959, Gilbert Plass published Carbon Dioxide and Climate in Scientific American, where he warned that if carbon dioxide is the most important factor in increasing the Earth's temperature, then long-term temperature records will rise continuously as long as people consume the Earth's reserves of fossil fuels. In 1962, Rachel Carson published the book Silent Spring, and in the 1960s, there were many grassroots environmental movements, nonprofits, and environmental institutes that got started. The very first Earth Day took place in 1970. In 1975, Walter Broker used the term global warming in a scientific paper. And that was when that phrase got introduced into the language of science and official media reports and stories. In 1985, the British Antarctic Survey reported ozone depletion over Antarctica. And in the late 80s, news coverage of global warming dramatically increased after a year of, waves, of heat waves and droughts. In 1987, the Vienna Convention's Montreal Protocol set international limits to emissions with an adverse effect on ozone, while fossil fuel interests created the Global Climate Coalition to create doubt in the minds of citizens and politicians about climate science. Finally, in 1991 and 1995, IPCC reports predicted that sea level rise would cause catastrophic social, economic, and political problems if no changes were made to current greenhouse gas emissions. So our project was specifically about how design might help artists respond to climate change. How could artists respond to this problem? This gave us the chance to think about reading groups as a method and to compare reading groups to other types of design methods. So from this perspective, a reading group is partially a research method. Um, and basically we can kind of compare this to what it might be like to bring in an expert speaker for a workshop. We also used reading groups as a generative method. And from that perspective, we can compare it with something like brainstorming exercises. One of the things that I liked about this project is that we found that reading groups were a very accessible way for groups to think through things like this. Several of the staff members from Latitude said that they liked the idea that people could use these reading groups to decide if they wanted to go to grad school. Although we donated our time to the project, running a group like this at Latitude as opposed to as a course at a college or university had the advantage of reaching out to people who, for whatever reason, weren't interested in additional formal education, but who might like to contribute to these types of discussions. Our group met for 16, hour total, 16 hours total with two one-hour sessions each week for eight weeks, and participants spent time each week preparing. If I compare that to a two-day workshop, this gave participants much more time to immerse themselves in the material. And additionally, having more time meant that people also had more time to get comfortable with each other as a group. This, I think, was very helpful because we expected people to be able to bring a critical perspective and to challenge each other's ideas. And that was a thing that we really observed happening. As people got more comfortable, they got better and better at doing this with each other. This is the syllabus that we used for this project. So to get ready for the group, my partner Renee and I met several times over the course of about six months to brainstorm ideas for how we would do this. We started a spreadsheet on Google Drive to track potential readings, product, projects that we could look at, and activities. We produced, this eight weeks, we produced an eight-week syllabus, but once the group got started, we started to improvise a little bit. We changed what we did each week based on how people were responding to the material, kind of both intellectually and emotionally. Um, because of the topic, one of the things that we noticed was that it was very easy for the discussion to become kind of emotionally challenging. So that was a thing where we could sort of alter how challenging the material was. When people needed a bit of a break, we could give that to them. After the group officially concluded, Three of the members continued working to write a short screenplay that explores the way climate appears in the news and media. I'm gonna talk about how our readings led to that specific idea soon. So many design methods deal with generating new ideas. One very well-known example are the brainstorming rules from the consulting firm IDEO. And the rules include things like, you should defer judgment when someone brings up an idea or 
You should encourage wild ideas. You should build on the ideas of others, et cetera. One of the critiques of this kind of brainstorming is that it can be a bit superficial and just based on the common knowledge of people that are in the room. This can also shield people from the fact that problem solving is always messy and most solutions are shaped by political agendas and constraints and things like that. So it can be a little difficult to say exactly where a creative idea comes from, but the idea for this specific project that we chose seems to have been inspired by two readings and one design project. So the first reading was from chapter one of the book, Imagining the Future of Climate Change by Shelley Strebe, whose timeline I showed earlier. So this chapter was about activism around the Dakota Access Pipeline and other indigenous-led projects that collectively imagined a different future. Shelley Strebe started off by describing the indigenous science statement for the March on Science, which was written by Robin Kimmerer, Lose Rosalind Lapeer, Melissa Nelson and Kyle White, and it was endorsed by more than 1,100 people for the 2017 March on Science. In the opening of their statement, Strebe quoted the authors as saying that long before Western science came here, there were indigenous scientists, native astronomers, ergonomists, geneticists, ecologists, engineers, botanists, zoologists, watershed hydrologists, pharmacologists, physicians, and more all engaged in the creation and application of knowledge, which promotes the flourishing of both human societies and the beings with whom we share the planet. The authors envisioned a productive symbiosis between indigenous and Western knowledge that served their shared goals of sustainability for land and culture. She went on in the chapter to describe other kinds of productive symbiosis, like the social media campaigns during the hashtag no DAPL project, from Bobby Jean Three Legs, Montgomery Brown, and Joseph White Eyes, who said that they thought of their work in the tradition of their elders and the American Indian movement in coming together nationally and internationally to form a solidarity movement that builds people power. So reading about the things that people did here created some unresolved tension for us in our reading group, because Although the protests for the Dakota Access Pipeline were successful in many ways, um, these even inspired the American politician Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to run for office. We now know that this pipeline is operational and very recently the company behind that project was actually seeking to increase the flow of oil. So unresolved tension kind of got started when we read this because although these were projects that we appreciated and projects that we liked. We, we definitely disliked the fact that they weren't more successful than they were or that they didn't have the, the kind of major output of stopping this pipeline. We generated more unresolved tension in our group when we read the article about democratic and authoritarian technologies by Langdon Winner, Do Artifacts Have Politics? So here, the question was, will government responses to climate be more compatible with authoritarian or democratic forms of government? So notwithstanding things like the Green New Deal, which explicitly deals with income redistribution, our, con our conversation here ended on a bit of a down note because it seemed very likely to us that government responses to climate would result in more authoritarian governments. So finally, there was a bit of a creative spark for a project idea for us. And this happened when we looked at a project called the New York Times Special Edition from the Yes Men. So in this project, the Yes Men, who are a culture jamming and artist activist duo, they printed a fictional version of the New York Times newspaper and distributed it on the streets of New York City. They did this on November 12th, 2008. This was about one week after the 2008 United States election. So the paper was dated July 4th, 2009, about six months later. And rather than including the paper's real motto, which is all the news that's fit to print, this paper's motto was all the news we hope to print. And the fictional paper included stories like Iraq war ends, nation sets its sights on building sane economy and maximum wage law succeeds. I have heard people describe this project as a liberal fantasy about the near future. Um, but when we saw this, our group had kind of an intense reaction to it. Because when we look up documentation for this project, 
the Yes Men documented a lot of really optimistic kind of hopeful responses to it. But for us, when we saw this, we thought that for lots of reasons, and including the kind of current concern over fake news, a project like this wouldn't work today the same way that it might have worked 12 years ago. So at this point, we decided that our prompt for making something, for making a kind of new speculative design project, would be how could we create a version of this project, a version of the New York Times Special Edition, that would still work today in 2020. So at that point, we started to brainstorm in a very focused way about what that might be like. Now, we're at a point where we focused into more kind of traditional writing, and we have a new challenge as we try to incorporate more critical perspectives into the drafts for this project as we write and revise them. Our goal is to create something that's interesting as a screenplay, but we also want this to build on the kind of critical material that we're reading. For me, I think this kind of approach makes creative work better, but this is also an interesting challenge because we're trying to produce work that lives up to the standard of the things that we're reading. Also, thinking about frustration as a state where creative ideas can happen or where creative work can start, I have observed that as we struggle with this project, other small projects kind of happen naturally. I think that there's definitely a limit to um, how much actual frustration is good for creativity. But in our case, creating a place where we could think of something like the New York Times project as specifically broken was really helpful for us. This to me seems to be a little bit at odds with the traditional brainstorming advice to withhold judgment during those sessions. As these projects develop, I look for ways to incorporate them into a kind of design research. There's a book called Design and Futures that Stuart Candy and Cher Potter edited. This includes articles about a pretty wide variety of projects where speculative design inspired conversations around different kinds of futures. By incorporating interviews and group discussions and then coding, analyzing, and synthesizing those results, um, we're basically looking for ways to apply what we learned in a very practical way. So to me, this is a way that sort of an experimental approach like speculative design fits in really neatly with sort of more traditional design research work. So one of the things that comes up sometimes is that the speculative and critical design can be a little bit experimental. And because of that, I sort of wonder, what is it that makes projects successful? Was there something about us hosting this reading group at Latitude that specifically made it more likely to succeed? So I would say that although we only had access to a few other groups there, most of them seemed to have been very successful. People tended to do their readings. They came prepared to have good discussions. So we asked Latitude staff if they thought that there was something sort of unique or special about that organization that helped to make those things happen. This is what their executive director had to say about that. She said that Latitude is good at bringing people together because she believes the staff of the organization want these things to happen and they choose to create a welcoming space. She mentioned several staff members that come from different communities, whether those are technological, social, artistic, or educational. She mentions that her and, uh, her and a fellow staff member are both educators at local colleges, so they bring that kind of aspect of their work into their work at Latitude. She said that the people who find them are often individuals who are forever learning, and that brings with it certain reading levels, interests in expanding knowledge, and good listening skills. We asked them also if they thought that Latitude working as both a service bureau and an arts organization was helpful, or if that kind of created challenges for them. Again, she said that it's helpful, challenging, and necessary in different ways. So the commercial approach for them afforded them the ability to be artistic in some situations. When the organization first started, they had an artist residency. And the fact that they had a service bureau brought in money that could pay for ink and paper and supplies and things like that. The older they get as an organization, she said that having a commercial practice has made them more viable for grants because organizations giving out grants often ask for matching funds. She said that finally they use the Service Bureau as a way to offer practical training for lab assistants. 
So when people volunteer at Latitude, they get kind of practical skills that they can use afterwards. So thinking about what our reading group was like, it had a few formal qualities that differentiated from other groups. If you're thinking about starting a reading group of your own, this list of qualities might be helpful for you. So first of all, open call versus invitation. When we set this group up, we didn't specifically choose group members. Instead, membership was open to the public. So we advertised the group to our networks on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, while Latitude promoted the group on its website, airing emails, and via their social media. We have participated in some groups where people were allowed to drop in at any time, but that wasn't the case here, where once the group started, we stopped advertising for new members. We think that this had a positive effect because this let the group get to know each other and build up trust. This was very important when we began critiquing ideas and approaching challenging topics with each other. Our group had a set schedule for eight weeks. Having a deadline was very helpful for us because this helped us to move from a kind of critical reading mode into a more generative mode of making something when we started working on a project. We met physically, um, and although we kind of considered doing video chat for remote sessions, uh, we ended up not doing that because we only had physical participants sign up. At this point, I'm extremely interested in doing something virtually just because this is a thing that we all have to do now. Um, I think this is going to offer other benefits because one of the things that we were concerned about as we were doing this project is because is that by doing something that required physical meetings in a city, you kind of limit it to certain kinds of people. You limit it to people that work in cities. You limit it to people that have free time in the evenings. These were all things that we would love to be able to use a virtual project to be able to kind of question those assumptions or bring in different types of people. I think the fact that Latitude is um, a place where they get participants from lots of different they try to promote their work to people from lots of different fields. So we were looking forward to being able to, to bring in people from, of, of, other, of other fields and with other backgrounds. In the end, we ended up with one participant with a background in biology and a journalist, but we mostly had people with backgrounds in the arts and design. Okay. So recently on Twitter, the designer Erica Hall said that there's a vacuum of design criticism because design thinking doesn't offer a framework or vocabulary for criticizing capitalism. She said that most culturally significant digital design today is the rendering of raw capitalism. So sometimes when I present work about something like speculative or critical design, people would say, I have such and such a problem at work. Is this a methodology I can use to solve that problem? In a case like this, I would remind people that approaches like this are probably better at problem finding than problem solving, to kind of borrow from Dunn and Raby's project that we looked at earlier. I mentioned earlier that working in a library, one of the things that I really value about that is that I get to interact with people who have expertise from other fields. So when it comes to design work, I'm always on the lookout for ways to do that as well. And working in a library, I'm especially interested in finding people that do critical librarianship. In cases like that, I would start to lean really heavily on their kind of domain expertise, especially when it comes to a specific problem, like if we were working on something involving a specific marginalized group in libraries. At that point, I would tend to concentrate on the design part of design research but I would still try to do it in a kind of critical and self-reflective way. If I was designing a workshop on a topic like this, I wouldn't be thinking of the kind of traditional workshop design problems, like how to organize the time that we would spend and how to manage people's energy levels. I'd also try to, to look for ways that I could incorporate a more critical perspective into the things that we do in a really deep way. At a panel discussion recently for a book called Bauhaus Futures, the contributors to the book were talking about the challenges of combining a critical perspective in courses they taught in design school. So one of the contributors specifically talked about the challenges of incorporating critical readings into those courses. And what she said was, 
She used to do several weeks of reading followed by several weeks of making. But what she found was that it was really difficult for her classes to apply the things they read to their projects. So she was doing experiments where she was looking at things like moving back and forth between critical, between being critical and generative faster, like maybe even within a single hour with a little bit of critical reading and a little bit of making so the two could inform each other better. Based on her comments and our experiences with our reading group, we put together this list of potential experiments. So these are different ways we could try to apply a more critical perspective to making things. So one of our ideas was to do a kind of free form verbal brainstorming and to take notes at the same time. This is a thing that we started to do in our group and we found it really helpful. Uh, one of the things that happens during a brainstorming session is that it's difficult to track the kind of ideas that come up. Taking notes was a thing that we really had a positive response with. At a certain point in time, we started to do a little bit of brainstorming followed by more concrete making. So kind of more concretely putting together a project. That was a thing that we had good results with. Some experiments that we haven't had a chance to try but we'd like to are we'd like to specifically pause to sketch out ideas. We'd like to experiment with little kind of critical write-ups or reviews. These would be things that were based on quick sketches or projects, but we'd kind of want like a, a small, slightly formal critique of those things. We'd like to try to incorporate little research projects or use field work or the news as input for things. I think that with any approach like this, it's important to approach all of these as experiments. So things like this might not necessarily succeed, but in general, I found that if I give myself permission to try things like this and I critique the way things work out, I can end up learning a lot in the process. So some of these things are very practical. Um, like I've learned a lot about running brainstorming sessions in general by doing this work, by running this group specifically. I tend to think of a lot of design approaches as things that are really embedded in capitalism. Um, so a project like this is a thing that can help me kind of think about where a design approach might just be encouraging overwork or overconsumption or things like that. In general, I am always interested in places where ideas that come from things like science and technology studies or feminism or race theory could kind of critique things like design activities or, or brainstorming exercises. To me, one of the most rewarding things about this work is to look for people that have expertise in those areas and see how I can incorporate it. This reading group was a chance for us to play with a kind of form of adult education. So we met in an arts organization, and our group was full of college-educated people who were interested in the arts. But it would be very interesting to me to run a group like this in another type of place with other types of people. So to imagine a group like this in a place like a hospice care center or in a prison or with people who just have different political ideas, I think that these are all possibilities for groups like this that would be very interesting. So reaching out to people like that would give us opportunities to think about our biases. And they would give us just different opportunities to improve our work by working with different people more closely. So I have a few questions for the group now. I'm going to open up the chat window again and open this up for a little more discussion. So first, are there any types of experiments that you could imagine when combining making and critique? Second, how might reading groups with different people or topics be different from this one? So if you were to have a reading group in a place like a hospice care center, how might that be different from working with a reading group of people who are artists? And finally, are there other types of partnerships with community organizations and libraries that you could imagine? So I'll give you guys a few minutes to think about this. Please let me know what you think. Do you have any feedback on this as a project? Do you have any ideas for things like this? I'll type the questions into the chat box next.
This comment about controversial topics is very interesting to me. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Can you expand that question a little bit? Or can you expand your comment a little bit more? The reason why I ask that is that I think that dealing with controversial topics or figuring out how to navigate those things is incredibly important for this kind of work. I think that it's a thing that people doing projects like this tend to tend to really concern themselves with. So I think that it's it's interesting to hear that as a comment. Um, Roman, for your comment, I'm definitely interested in trying to figure out ways to kind of question assumptions like that. I have for sure experienced um, there's a difficulty of kind of doing these things in practice, for sure. I'm definitely always looking for opportunities to try to do things like that. But I would say I don't know how to do those things either. Those are kind of challenges that I would love to be able to take on. But for a lot of those things, I haven't been able to been able to kind of try to take problems like that on yet. Okay, thank you so much for that extra information. Um, I agree completely. Um, another one of the things that I notice is that every topic is so different. Um, the things that I might learn about climate don't apply to other problems. So um, for example, um, thinking about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a thing that's important for some of the some of the groups that I might work with. But I see that discussing topics like that or trying to make improvements, that problem is so different from problems around climate that essentially I have to start over. Um, I have to start over and learn things from ground zero. I have to start and learn things from scratch. I, there are people who have written a lot about wicked problems and the fact that all wicked problems are unique. I think that that is really, really true. Um, there might be things that I learn about um, having a discussion with someone on a topic that's challenging or difficult, but as the topic changes, I essentially I have to start over each time that it's a new big problem like that because the way that the problem shows itself is totally different. I'm going to finish by talking a little bit about ideas that I've had about how libraries might specifically incorporate this kind of design. So I'm going to do that next. OK. So Shannon Marie Robinson recently wrote an article where she described critical design as a form of research through design in which objects and narratives help criticize the status quo and conceptualize theory. She went on to say that critical design might be employed in librarianship to help us bridge theory and practice, exploring current paradigms and approaches to our work, as well as uncovering assumptions about what a library is and what a librarian does. So originally, the session that we're in right now was going to be in person. But because of the coronavirus, obviously, we switched from that format to a virtual lecture. 
And there were activities that I had originally planned to do that don't work the same online as they would have in person. One of those things was going to be a game, but this doesn't work unless all of the people participating can sit really close to each other and share physical objects like cards. With social distancing, we can't do that. So now what this does is this basically gives me lots of projects to work on because I have to figure out how to do things like this digitally. I have to learn how to do them in video conferences and not just in person. I know that lots of groups of people have been asking, like thing, asking for things like this for a very long time. People with disabilities can find video conferencing easier to use than easier to use than in-person activities. And lots of people can't afford funding for conferences, so they end up wanting virtual events. So in this case, switching to virtual events for the sake of the coronavirus kind of forcing us to do it doesn't necessarily solve the problems for everyone else. It doesn't necessarily necessarily solve problems for people who have disabilities and things like that. However, I think that it is still an opportunity to be able to make improvements that would help those people um, in big ways. So I think that that's good. When something like this happens, I think this is also a chance to think about the things that we're doing. So even if I don't want to do it, an event like this makes me start to wonder is an approach like speculative or critical design worth it in the first place? Because right now, everyone needs to adapt to what's happening very, very quickly. So why would you bother to use an approach like speculative or critical design in the first place? So one of the things that I think about a lot with this kind of work is how the relationship between the designer and the client is very different. So I don't think when I say design here, I'm not specifically talking about things like graphic design, but I'm also applying that term to people like web developers or librarians who design new courses. So for the sake of argument, everyone is a designer when they, when they do things like that. And when a designer is working in a more traditional mode, they're very clearly working for their client. So in this way of working, if a designer notices flaws in their client's project, they will use their skill to hide or disguise those flaws. So sometimes there can be kind of backstage workflows where a client wants to hide something from the end user. So for just one example, um, an end user might not like the labor practices of an online store if they knew more about them. But working in a very traditional way, a designer does what they can do to hide that from the, from the end user. And in lots of cases, these kinds of things are just kind of implicitly understood. Designers just realize that it's their job to to protect their client, essentially. Um, Dunn and maybe might have called that kind of approach affirmative and not critical. Critical design is a really different way to approach it, where instead of hiding things like that, you might explore things like that specifically. Working in a library, there are day-to-day -day issues that come up that can be very difficult to discuss. So colonialism in libraries is an example. Um, thinking in the thinking from the perspective of someone in the United States, if a library has to make decisions about how to provide access to, say, Native American materials, this is a case where the people who produce the material have relatively less power than the power that the library has. So how can the library have productive conversations about this? And these conversations can be really challenging. There are all kinds of power dynamics that are in the room. Um, supervisors and managers at different levels all have different challenges when it comes to raising critiques like this. Ideally, you could bring in members of the community that are affected by decisions like this, but even getting to that point in the first place can be a real challenge. So for me personally, I like to think of something like speculative and critical design as a way to help people practice having those types of conversations. So basically, it's a way to help people get better at giving and receiving genuine critiques like this from a variety of different perspectives. It can be really hard for people to imagine alternatives to the status quo. And doing that in practice is really difficult. Every workplace has norms for professional behavior, sort of unspoken rules about how to dress or speak, about what topics are appropriate or how to approach challenging things when they come up. A lot of the social issues that libraries face, I think, can involve questioning those norms. 
So I think that approaches like speculative and critical design can be helpful. They give people a little bit of a chance to practice being uncomfortable and to think about things from new perspectives. I'm gonna close this session by giving two examples of speculative design that deal with privacy, but they do it in two really different ways. The first one has a very non-controversial approach, but the second was specifically designed to be provocative. So thinking about how to be provocative is a really dominant concern for a lot of the projects that people do in this way. So the first project we have is something called the Alternet by the designer Sarah Gold. So this was a proposal for a communications network where people get to own their own data. And again, this was a product that was never actually produced, but it's essentially a thought experiment. What Sarah did was she made a package that included a hardware router that you could print on a 3D printer. And she designed data licenses and an app that let you see how your data is going to be used in any given situation. If you'd like to see more about this project, you can look at it on Sarah's website. I included a link to that below. The next project is one called The Selfish Ledger, which was a video that was about interfaces that modify user behavior. This video was written by Nick Foster, who is from the Near Future Laboratory and the head of design at Google X, and David Murphy, who is a senior UX engineer at Google. Although this video was never officially released, a representative from Google gave the following statement about it. They said that, we understand if this video is disturbing, it was designed to be. This is a thought experiment by the design team from years ago that uses a technique known as speculative design to explore uncomfortable ideas and concepts in order to provoke discussion and debate. This is not related to any current or future projects. I found this video very provocative so what I'd like to do now is watch this one together. I'm going to post a link to this into the chat window. And if we can all watch this last video and then talk about it a little bit afterwards, that would be perfect. OK, so let's watch this one. Please let me know when you're done. I'll give a few extra seconds again for lag, just in case. And then we'll have a few questions for this one afterwards, too.
Hein. Okay, I've got a few questions for this one, and then we can finish up. So here are my questions for this. Have you ever worked with someone who is very good at providing critical feedback? How did that person do it? Second, what kinds of situations do you think might call for more provocative or confrontational types of work? And third, what types of problems in libraries do you think would lend themselves to a speculative design approach? Whether that's something that's more confrontational, like the selfish ledger, or whether that's something that's a little bit more gentle, like the project from Sarah Gold that we saw, the alternate. So I'll give a few minutes for this, and let me know what you think. And also, I'm not sure what other people have scheduled after this, so if you need to to leave, please feel free to bail out whenever you need to. 
I definitely yeah. appreciate everyone's attention. Thank you all so much for being here. I really, I really do appreciate that. John, actually, I'm sorry. We, we are waiting for the next lectures, or they are waiting to finish this lecture. Uh, okay. Can we just like think about these questions at home and uh, <laughs> and maybe of course, send of it course. to you at uh, you answers as a home for <laughs> homework or something. No, please do. Um, just finally, I'm thinking about doing another. I'm thinking about doing another reading group in the fall. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add my contact information to the comments. If anyone is interested in that, please stay in touch. Okay, John. So thank you very much for this lecture. It was great, and uh, hope we will see each other on the reading group or some some in person. Uh, sometime in the future. I hope so too. Uh, so thank you very much again. And uh, now I will switch to check if you, if you will. <laughs> please, please. Thank okay. you very much, Roman. Thank you very much and goodbye. Uh, tak goodbye. jo, děkuji vám za to, že jste se zúčastnili přednášky uh, Johna Junga uh, z Chicago. Já se trochu omlouvám, že, to, že se to trošku protáhlo a snad to nehodilo nějakou velkou bombu do plánu pana ředitele Tomáše Řeháka a 